and she also will be available tomorrow from 12 to 1. There's a welcome and open house in the CAF clinic space on the third floor. Professor Freeman will be there um, tomorrow as well. So I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Gloria. Apologies for microphone. Okay. So many thanks to Lori for that very kind introduction and her hospitality since I've been here. Many thanks to Courtney for setting this all up and to all of the staff at CAPS and the faculty and every one of you for making time to come and listen to me today. I really appreciate it and I'm excited to hear your feedback. So what I'm going to do is start by showing you some slides of the latest incarnation of the alt-right obsession with milk. <laughs> so this is a protest at Shia LaBeouf's New York anti-Trump art installation called He Will Not Divide Us, where neo-Nazi protesters danced shirtless, chugging jugs of milk, and saying that their action demonstrated their opposition to the vegan agenda. <laughs> Milk is a part of the Twitterverse. So it replaced Pepe the Frog as the emoji symbolizing white supremacy and superiority in the Twitter names of some newsworthy white supremacists. This is Richard Spencer, president of the white nationalist think tank, National Policy Institute, and Tim Treadstone, an alt-right social media personality called Baked Alaska, with glasses of milk in their Twitter names as you can see. Here is some uh, poetry about our former president, a map that tracks lactose intolerance around the world that has been much discussed on the alt-right web site threads. And for movie fans, there's a terrifying scene, spoiler alert, in the Best Picture nominated film Get Out of a white supremacist slowly sipping on a glass of milk. Now this association between white supremacy and milk is not new. In fact, it has been around for about 100 years. In the 1920s, this National Dairy Council pamphlet explained that the people who have used liberal amounts of milk and its products, meaning white people, are progressive in science and every activity of the human intellect. In 1933, a history of agriculture of the state of New York declared, a casual look at the races of people seems to show that those using much milk are the strongest physically and mentally, the most enduring people. Of all races, the Aryans seem to have been the heaviest drinkers of milk and the greatest users of butter and cheese, a fact that may in part account for the quick and high development of this division of human beings. So a few years ago, in my article, The Unbearable Whiteness of Milk, I explored how USDA policy around milk also harms people of color. Despite overwhelming medical evidence that milk consumption is linked to many serious illnesses, and some that are not as serious, like lactose intolerance, the USDA continues to encourage people to drink milk through the federal dietary guidelines see that milk has its own little section of the mind plate, and to dispose of the surplus of milk that the Farm Bill mandates the USDA to purchase by giving it to communities of color, either directly or indirectly through nutrition programs where people of color are disproportionately represented, such as WIC, Nutrition Program for Women and Children in Formula, and in school lunchrooms, which I'll talk about more, and even by creating a marketing branch called Dairy Management Inc. that designed an award-winning race-targeted advertising campaign. Here was a critique of Spike Lee's participation in this campaign. And it partnered with fast food companies to create products with more cheese in them, including Domino's Seven Cheese American Legends Pizza. <laughs> and the USDA sponsored opening this, launching this product during the Super Bowl. 
And although white people eat the most fast food, it makes up a disproportionate amount of the diet of people living in poor urban communities of color. I see this as an example of food oppression. So food oppression, a term that I came up with in 2007 and I've been developing ever since, is a facially neutral law, policy, or practice that related to food that creates health disparities along race, gender, and class lines. Cultural myths about personal responsibility that ignore structural determinants of food choice as well as racial stereotypes make these disparities appear natural. So today I'm going to talk about some of the latest research that I've been doing into how technology and big data is interacting with food oppression, specifically in the areas of fast food marketing to youth of color, behavioral economics, and obesity diagnoses. So you probably know that poor nutrition, combined with lack of exercise, overtook smoking as the leading cause of premature deaths in the United States a couple of years ago. Blacks and Latinos, as well as some other groups, such as Native Hawaiians, suffer from the conditions that lead to these deaths at higher rates than what? So these disparities exist in high blood pressure, in strokes, diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes, which is related to health, premature death, heart disease, cancer, and obesity, which I will talk about more. And black women in particular are at risk. So if you believe in corporate responsibility, you might argue that McDonald's and its counterparts should pay attention to these statistics and refrain from targeted marketing that exploits the structural factors that lead to these disparities. But instead, fast food companies are spending millions to keep up with the latest technology that allows them to target communities of color more precisely. For example, data collected by Nielsen allows fast food companies to identify and target small sections of the population. Their data revealed that this show, called It's Me or the Dog, is particularly appealing to Latino bacon lovers. And to respond to this information, advanced technology allowed them to substitute a regularly scheduled ad for one of their own, such as this one for the Bacon Club Chalupa offered by Taco Bell. And perhaps most disturbingly, the companies have recently zeroed in on youth of color. Now, these young people are extremely attractive to fast food companies for a number of reasons. First, they tend to spend more money on fast food than their white peers. Second, they're considered trendsetters, definers of what is or will soon be considered cool. Third, they're particularly vulnerable to targeted marketing because they're in the unique position of developing their personal and racial identities at the same time. And they're very open to outside influences. Youth of color also overwhelmingly have cell phones, even when their families cannot afford computers or tablets at home. Fast food companies track the location of these cell phones and deliver coupons to customers who are within a few blocks of their outlets. In many urban neighborhoods of color, young people of color are always within a few blocks of a fast food place. And of course, they're always on their phones. Then when they get into McDonald's, they're encouraged to become brand ambassadors and do their own free advertising for the company by sending out snaps on Snapchat with the McDonald's logo and its messages in the frame. Kids can also engage in this type of free advertising when they're texting, which of course they're also always doing. And for even younger kids, there are racially targeted McDonald's games and apps. The World Medical Association recommends restricting this type of marketing because it has an adverse effect on children's body weight and health. 
Now, if the USDA, as one of the government entities responsible for health and nutrition, wanted to counter the fast food industry's marketing tactics, they could do so, even without regulating. In the recent past, when stopping young people from smoking was a public health priority, there was a very successful truth campaign directed at youth that exposed how the tobacco industries manipulated them in order to make a profit. Young people responded with outrage and reduced their smoking. Similar messages to young people about the food industry have a similar effect. Eighth graders who perceived healthy eating as an act of social justice made better food choices. These students acted in defiance against corporations that market to vulnerable children and engineer junk food to make it addictive. <coughs> Appealing to their values of autonomy and social consciousness was more effective than teaching them about long-term health consequences. Of course, for this type of campaign to be effective in the food context, other food must be available unlike smoking, where a person can simply stop smoking. But the USDA is unlikely to fund a new truth campaign because the campaign would go directly against its interests. For example, in exchange for the donation of much needed resources, fast food companies have a strong presence in our public schools. So teachers give out coupons for fast food as a reward for good grades. They distribute materials like fire safety guides with fast food coupons inside. And students and classes that raise the most money during PTO drives earn fast food prizes. Fast food is also on school buses, scoreboards, school signs, school games, and school fundraisers. So these pervasive messages contradict the expectation that our schools will look after the physical well-being of our children. It also disproportionately affects students of color who attend public schools at higher rates than white students and participate more often in the USDA school lunch, breakfast, and milk program. Through its commodities program, the USDA uses its school meal programs to dispose of the surpluses that result from the Farm Bill subsidies of certain products, including milk, meat, soy, and corn. And when these products enter school meals, the commodities take the form of corn dogs, chicken nuggets, tater tots, sausage links, and pizza. And these processed foods contribute to high rates of obesity and type 2 diabetes, which black children suffer from at greater rates. They also, as I said, disproportionately participate in the school lunch program and are disproportionately eligible for free lunches. The government provides further support for unhealthy eating at school by labeling pizza a vegetable. This cooperation between the government and the food industry is no coincidence. <coughs> you can see here that most of the fast food industry's contributions go to Republicans. We have now a fast food president. <laughs> and racial stereotypes disguise the impact of government action on health disparities. The media often portrays Latinx, Latinx, and Blacks as overweight lazy, and weak-willed. And the myth of personal responsibility casts individuals as in complete control of their diet and health, when in reality, food choices are constrained by external structural circumstances. Social norms and racial stereotypes prevent us from recognizing that disproportionate health outcomes are a result of deliberate government policies that could be regulated if the will is there. And that is food oppression. 
Instead of regulating corporations that stand to profit from selling as much harmful food as possible, or cutting the ties that give these corporations access to children in schools, the USDA chooses instead to focus its efforts to improve health on changing the minds of consumers. The agency has invested millions in creating two research centers on behavioral economics at Cornell and Duke. These centers concentrate on two areas, school lunchrooms and food assistance recipients in the SNAP and WIC program. From a food oppression perspective, this is quite ironic because the best way to have students eat healthier in school lunchrooms would be to provide them with healthy food, not to adjust the lighting or the table size or the placement of food products. Similarly, individuals receiving nutritional assistance lack access to healthy food and would benefit most from receiving this type of food from the USDA. But the principles behind these behavioral economic centers suggest that school children and benefit recipients hold the keys to better health in their own hands, if only they could be nudged to use them. So here's some examples of the studies they've done. They found that children will eat more apples <coughs> if the apples are cut than if they are whole. Children will select more fruits and vegetables if these fruits and vegetables have cute names. And SNAP recipients will choose healthier items if they are near the counter. Okay. Strong critiques of the methodologies used in these studies have emerged, also putting their results into serious depth. And the other focus of government policy is on the FDA's nutrition facts label. This is the old one, and this is the new one, and it has an added sugar label. And there's been much debate and discussion about what kinds of labels might communicate more effectively to consumers. In response, there's been much resistance from the food industry. So some studies have shown that visual symbols like stop signs, traffic signal colors, and signs like this showing what you would have to do to work off a bottle of soda, such as piloting a plane. <laughs> I guess it's something we all have an opportunity to do sometimes. <laughs> it are more effective than the confusing side of package labels that we use today. Even moving these labels to the front of the package and reducing the amount of information that they contain would be more effective. But the food industry continues to fight all of these proposed changes. They might lose some of these battles, and even if they do, and they're forced to shoulder some costs associated with new package design and some shifts in consumer preference, nutrition labeling will still likely have no effect on the consumers who need increased access to healthy food the most because of their severely restricted or non-existing food choices. In fact, studies show that it's basically white people who shop at Whole Foods, probably many of us here, who are the most likely to alter their food choices in response to nutrition information, and that these changes do not result in any overall change in health outcomes, okay? only purchasing. So why is the USDA so focused on nutrition labels and behavioral economics? I think it's because these policy choices result in the lowest cost to corporations in comparison with regulating harmful food ingredients, reducing the subsidies of unhealthy food, in implementing high nutrition standards for school lunches, limiting marketing, or most other policy options. And because the people affected the most dramatically by these food policy choices often lack meaningful political access and that is food oppression. Finally, I want to talk about obesity, which has gained the status of being a national public health crisis, despite the fact that the method for measuring obesity is not rooted in health evaluations, but is merely statistical. This is the BMI chart that tells you where you fall on the scale. I'm sure everyone is quickly calculating their own here. <laughs> But, you know, again, not, it's not as significant as it looks, so don't panic. Uh, from underweight to extremely obese. It multiplies age and weight 
and looks at how far a person is from the mean to determine how appropriate their weight is. To illustrate how arbitrary this measurement can be, when the cutoff point for obesity was changed by two points, millions more Americans became clinically obese overnight, helping to precipitate this so-called crisis. It's a crisis that has opened up a $100 billion a year weight loss industry, dominated by diet foods, fitness centers, and pharmaceuticals. A problematic aspect of obesity from a food oppression perspective is that there are dramatic racial and gender disparities in obesity diagnoses, with black women receiving the highest number. So for example, here in 2014, doctors labeled 82% of black women and 77% of Latinx obese or overweight, compared to 63% of white women. Now, there are many reasons for these alarming disparities in obesity diagnoses. One is racial disparities in medical treatment. Doctors consistently misdiagnose medical problems in black women, treat them less, disbelieve their claims about symptoms, and view them as difficult and non-compliant patients. There are also racial disparities in obesity-related medical studies and research. So for example, bariatric surgery is the most effective method of reducing obesity and type 2 diabetes, but it's almost never recommended for black women. Another cause of disparities is culturally inappropriate health interventions. Most interventions recommend non-culturally specific, which means white, diets. And interventions often don't include personal counseling or community support groups which studies show black women need to lose and keep off weight. Disparities are also due in part to the limited access to healthy food in poor urban neighborhoods, racially targeted marketing, government subsidies, and limited access to safe spaces for recreation. There have been some attempts by public health <coughs> providers to design more culturally specific obesity interventions. But this focus on health interventions falls squarely into the paradigm of personal responsibility that obscures all of the structural reforms that are necessary to combat food oppression. Another troubling aspect of race, gender, and obesity is when obesity diagnoses are used to pathologize black women's bodies and exercise increased surveillance and control over them. From this perspective, Obesity can be viewed as a fabricated disease that operates to identify bad citizens who are costing the state and their fellow citizens billions of dollars in unnecessary health care costs. So the CDC reports that annual medical costs associated with obesity are $190 billion, accounting for more than 20% of all medical spending. And because obesity is viewed as a manifestation of bad characteristics, like laziness and lack of willpower, under this framework, obese individuals are thieves, stealing this money from the state, from their employers, and from taxpayers. Because of their disproportionate diagnoses, black women are positioned as the greatest perpetrators of this theft, which aligns with the stereotypes about black women particularly the welfare queen, who is both a bad citizen and a moral deviant. In this way, disproportionate obesity diagnoses and stereotyping contribute to the larger problem of the criminalization of black women that justifies increased surveillance and discipline. For example, when I was preparing this talk, I googled two words, obese woman. This is the first result that came up and this one was the second. You can see that you don't even need to click the link and see the images in order to understand just from the names that these articles are about black women. But not only is it wrong to associate obesity with criminal and cruel activity, it's often wrong even to associate it with bad health. In fact, many studies have shown that individuals labeled overweight or obese live longer than thinner ones. 
Large bodies can be a reflection of bone density and other physical attributes related to body types common in black women that are pathologized as obesity simply because they deviate from the white thin ideal. In several studies of obesity, presumably white researchers puzzled over and lamented black cultural perceptions of large black women as attractive and their own self-acceptance and lack of desire to lose weight. Often, even when black women express a desire to lose weight, it's not due to low self-esteem, but just a wish to overcome physical limitations or feel better. And researchers describe this self-acceptance in terms that indicate cognitive dissonance, such as misperception and over-optimism. They don't understand that large female bodies have historically been viewed as beautiful and as signals of prosperity, fertility, good cooking, and good health. When healthy black women are diagnosed as obese, these diagnoses trigger a number of harmful consequences. Classifying three quarters of black women as sick increases their marginalization and further justifies many kinds of social control over black women, including putting their children into foster care, the over surveillance of women in public housing and on welfare, and mass incarceration. These diagnoses also support the reduction of social services, particularly when it comes to providing health care. They lead to intersectional discrimination along the axes of race, gender, and weight. And although weight discrimination is a major obstacle to getting basics like housing and employment, weight discrimination does not receive any protection. The ability to identify black women susceptible to misleading and intrusive obesity diagnoses has been increased by big data. Insurance companies and doctors use big data to identify at-risk patients by monitoring individuals' purchases of products like fast food and donuts. Ironically, marketing companies and the healthcare industry collect the same kind of data on food purchases, one to target consumers and the other to identify health risks. Based on this data, individuals receive scores reflecting their risky behavior. Now, a lot of this data is acquired through life logging the recording of all of a person's daily activities, which can be done through a device, such as a camera, a bracelet, Google glasses, or even a phone. And some of this data is collected without our knowledge or permission. For example, iPhone 5s and higher have a health app that records your health information without you ever turning the app on. Okay? This is the time in the talk where people pick up their phones and start looking, but just wait a few minutes because I'm almost done. And then, and then you can get upset and start suing Apple. And this data collection is problematic in several ways. First, it's another way of keeping the focus on individual behavior instead of structural reform. Second, it's misleading. Research shows that health behaviors account for less than 25% of the variations in people's health. Biology and quality of medical care account for another 25%, and the remainder comes down to social determinants. The potential to use big data to discriminate is a problem that's been flagged by the Federal Trade Commission in areas such as consumer credit and hiring, but not in regard to racial disparities in obesity diagnosis or health. And despite the FTC's reports recognizing the potential to discriminate using big data, so far there's been no regulation to guard against this. We need to be vigilant about how the use of ostensibly neutral data can mask practices that increase health disparities and entrench some individuals in cycles of poverty and oppression. This is all very depressing, I know. I have a small section now that thinks about <laughs> potential solutions that I'll just throw out and then I'll look forward to hearing from you. Intersectional discrimination that includes race and gender and weight and other types of discrimination should be actionable. Okay? The BMI should not be used any longer as a measurement of weight-related health problems. There should be a shift 
in policy focus from individual behavior, choices, and education to structural determinants of health. The USDA and the DHHS should harness their power for good, using it to send out well-timed messages to young people of color who are about to cash in on their McDonald's coupons and offering them even more bang for their buck at a local farmer's market or a produce stand, like Detroit's Grocery Incubator Project. These are the kind of places that should be subsidized. Technology can also improve access to healthy foods through programs like Ball to Market, Baltimore's internet-based food delivery program. We need a strict separation between state and industry, putting an end to corporations' ability to determine health and food policy. I've also been looking at the possibility of relying on constitutional principles, specifically the 13th Amendment, to challenge food oppression. Racial health disparities linked to government control over diets, particularly black public school students, and the disproportionate formula feeding of black infants, represent a vestige or incident of slavery. They're also a result of disparate treatment that should be unconstitutional under equal protection. So I'm exploring these constitutional remedies in a new paper, and in my book that's forthcoming in Stanford University Press in the spring, which is about racial disparities in infant feeding. Finally, despite this long list of potential reforms, I think what we really need is a food policy revolution. So now I look forward to hearing it. Very hungry. Uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, three uh, small footnotes uh, to what you've said. Okay. Um, people probably don't know, but uh, rationing existed in the United Kingdom until 1956. Um, and I think uh, as a sort of war baby, I've never eaten as well uh, up until 1956, where, where thereafter I could have chips and candy and as much sugar as I could consume. So, you know, there's that one thing. Secondly, uh, in extensive traveling in the developing world, I have yet to see a fat, obese day laborer, uh, male or female. Uh, and finally, uh, last week I read that uh, World Health Organization uh, focusing on women in the developing nations said that you are well advised to feed your own baby rather than go for milk formula. Uh, and immediately I think your president came out and said, let's support the milk industry in the USA. Yeah. And so I will have an op-ed out about that within the next day or so, or just in the editing stages. Um, and yes, that was an excellent example of food oppression, or what I would call first food oppression, and really demonstrated how close the industry and the government are, right? Because we saw an extreme reaction by the U.S. government threatening to withdraw military aid and trade from Ecuador for simply putting forth a resolution saying that women should breastfeed if they can. And the reason was that the formula industry has been losing money in the United States because many people here understand or are given information that is not misleading about breastfeeding and formula, whereas in other countries there is formula marketing that suggests that they are equivalent. And so the resolution was seeking to share that information with the rest of the world, and Trump attempted to block that. So well, thank you. Indeed, very depressing. Um, so let me see if I can um, perhaps unfairly characterize what you said and let you respond. Please do. That um, government is, is, is forcing the wrong foods down down people's throats at the behest of industry, largely, um, and other special interests. And the solution to that is not to empower consumers uh, 
with a whole lot of better information and broaden their choices, but rather for government um, to disengage from industry and to impose enlightened choices uh, and impose those on people because um, <clears throat> if I understood you correctly, ultimately you really can't trust people to make the right choices. And based on personal experience, I you know I have some sympathy with that, but I think as a uh, as sort of a political matter, it's uh, that's a really hard sell. It is, um, but it also has a lot to do with framing, right? So when we talk about food regulation, I would like to compare it to, say, seatbelts, right? These are not the kinds of regulations that tell you what's best for you and what you want in some sort of nanny state, terribly, um, you know, tyrannical way. This is a way to provide you with a way to make your life longer and stop you from being sick, right? And then. Uh, I forget what I mean. <laughs> but I might remember if you want to respond. Well, I mean, um, uh, well, I guess what I'm responding to is that is that freedom of choice is a is a, is a highly held value. It is. And um, and people want and people want to be able to choose their food. This is about choice. This is about choice. Well, so I, you, not, I, I, I hear yeah. you. I hear you re re reacting negatively to people's. To limitations on people's right. choices, but at the same time, when when people argue for informing consumers and giving them lots of choice, you see you seem to suggest that's a false promise, and that people need nudges and seatbelt requirements and structural government policies that make sure that the right foods are in the lunch counter and not the wrong foods. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you know, as a consumer and as a parent. If the school is going to give food to a child, the food should be healthy. I, I just, why should a child get to choose between pizza and french fries, right, and brown rice and, and vegetables? Or we should be teaching them the right thing. There are plenty of opportunities for people to make their own bad choices if we judge them that way later, right? Because it's fine to eat 90% healthy food and then go ahead and eat your chips and your chocolate or your candy or whatever it is, right? But if we give kids only bad food, that's a problem. And half of the kids in the US that are eating all school lunches, like school breakfast, school snacks, school lunches, they don't eat food at home during those days. So that's five days a week where the only thing they're eating is what the USDA gives them. So I strongly believe that food should be healthy. And I think that the framing of this as taking away people's choice is just a false framing that really evokes something that's important to Americans that helps to obscure what's really going on. I mean, nobody can take away your choice of what to eat, right? Sometimes they say, well, kids just dump the, you know, the non-chocolate milk down the, the thing, so we better give them chocolate milk. Well, obviously there's a distinction in which yeah. you helped draw out that there's between students who are required to attend public education and then are, are served a meal. And the question is, what, what if any choices do they have versus supposedly responsible adults? Right, almost not. And also the, the whiter you are, the wealthier you are, the more choices you have. So the more times you choose to eat your chips and your candy, you can also choose to say, but then I'm gonna eat some broccoli, right? But if you don't have all the options, then your bad health is controlled by forces outside of your control. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, there are a couple things I want to ask or maybe get your response to. One, your, your talk, it represents a confluence of both bad federal policy, but the other part of it, I mean, your talk didn't address it, but it's also a function of bad local policy with the way the cities structure themselves. Um, you know, the former first lady, you know, when she was in the White House, she talked about food deserts. And how, you know, because the way you, when you mentioned that people don't have choices, I used to live in the desert when I was a grad student. 
you know, I didn't have a car. And I put on weight because I went to McDonald's because I could not get to the grocery store to buy something healthier. Um, and that's the reality for many communities, but that's also a product of local zoning, local planning, and 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 it's it's a free market failure. I mean, the market says, hey, we don't want to cater to these people, you know, and none of that ever gets addressed. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would like like for you to respond to is. Given that, you know, how can how can cities, you know, I don't say be compelled, but I guess it, it is be compelled to say, hey, you know, you need to do better by your citizens to provide like this transportation infrastructure, to provide the planning infrastructure, the development infrastructure, so that these food needs for its most vulnerable citizens are served, because that's the that's a big part of the problem. That's right. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. So the, my first, very first article on this topic was about access to healthy food. Um, and I'm sorry that I didn't talk about it very much. It is because I've been moved away and, and onto these other things. You're 100% right that most of the problem is local or could be solved locally, right? But there is very much this federal tie-in, right? So for example, as Lori mentioned, when I worked in Berkeley last year, I had my kids in the Berkeley school public school system. And the school that they went to opted out of the federal food, the USDA program, and provided their own. Right? But you can really only do that in a community like Berkeley, which is like full of rich white people. Right? So if there's some way for cities to use some of their budget to also incentivize a shift away from the USDA, right, that would be a great solution totally agree about the infrastructure, the transportation, right? So we're busing kids around to go to more supposedly integrated schools. Why can't we bus people around to do shopping? Right? I think that you're you're really thinking along good and creative lines and I'd like you to write a paper on this. <laughs> we can collaborate. Uh, two observations, very interesting presentation. The first one being, I mean, picking up from the point, is freedom of choice absolute in nature? Or can it be restricted? Can some of your constitutional provisions be used in that regard? Considering the fact that when we talk about these issues, it's the taxpayer's money which is going into the health issues. And I'll share one example as what has happened in the UK. Uh, two councils have passed a resolution in the UK where if people are obese and if they don't take control of their eating habits, there would be restrictive health care being provided to them. It's quite challenging, I and mean, it's debatable, and it's been challenged by, people, by the council, by the human rights activists, because there's always a debate which goes on. But then the real question is, if you do not try to put interventions into it, the whole question is about medical aid, right to, uh, right to medical aid, whose taxpayer's money is going, and what sort of solutions can be provided in that regard. You know, do you think you can use your constitutional provisions to have restrictive uh, restrictions on freedom of choice? I don't fully understand that. Question. I mean, you have the freedoms, right? Yeah. Anything can be done in the name of freedom. But can restrictions be qualified for that? Uh, yeah. How do we put it? Uh, you can't have absolute choices. Do you think there should None be absolute choices? None of us have absolute yeah. choices, right. I because mean, constitution is constrained by our surroundings. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like, I can give you an example from India, where I work. There is a freedom of choice, but freedom of choice is restricted in the larger common good of the society. So can, can a US provision, constitution provision be used in that regard? So, for example, because, a right to healthy yeah. food in the Constitution. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, the the most obvious constitutional solution would be something like that, right? So, other countries' constitutions give positive rights, right? You have a, a right to clean water, a right to shelter, a right to healthy, sustainable food, right? But we are so far away from that, right? Particularly because of what John has mentioned of how sacred this idea our freedom of choice is here, right? We don't want our government and our constitution telling us everybody must have this. That sounds like socialism. That sounds like communism, right? That's just not going to cut it. 
particularly under the current administration. We're, right, we're moving in another direction, moving away from that, not towards it. Right. But if it were possible, politically, I think it would be effective. Um, thank you for a really interesting talk. So my question for you is, as a scientist, I was really interested in the section of your talk that dealt with big data and how that's going to be two very different perspectives mm -hmm. um, to kind of reach the same sort of stigmatization of people who are obese and also lead into like uh, the issue of like lower health outcomes for, uh, for various parts of our society. So my question to you is, as a scientist, what can we be doing better to make better use of that data that is being collected with or without people's best interests at heart? Yeah. Um, that would be a great conversation to have, that we should sit down. <laughs> because no, because that's exactly the kind of collaboration that I would like to have. Because I'm limited by being a law professor, right? And I don't have the scientific background, I don't have the sociology background, and how to deal with data and what to do with it. But I think that kind of partnership is so important, right? So like legal medical partnerships, and scientists, and getting everybody in on this. Right, very relevant to this, the ideas of how is the administration using science right now, right? Is science even relevant to policy? We need to make it relevant, right? So let's talk. Please do connect. Hi. Um, I'm also a scientist. I'm actually a social epidemiologist. So very cool. Thank social you too for coming. Yeah. Um, I study food security in Sub-Saharan Africa. Wow. Um, so I can talk a little bit more to you afterwards. Um, and I know that in my case, you know, I, I would hope that by doing the research that I do, that I am having an impact. But something that I found particularly satis satisfying is partnering from the onset with an NGO. So in my case, I'm working directly with Care International. And at the very least, we know that the results that we generate through our research will be implemented or will be integrated into care strategies in these particular communities. We don't know what will happen. There's no guarantee when we publish that it will have an impact at a greater scale than that, but at least partnering with a specific organization or government agency, I've honestly found that there's more likely that there's going to be changes if it's an NGO versus government because there's less red tape there. That is one very concrete way that I think research scientists can try to increase the likelihood that the research will be implemented on the ground. Yeah, um, I think it's really great that you're here too and that we're uh, touching on international and global issues because they're so connected, right? And we're seeing the U.S. trying to impose its food oppression onto the whole world, right? By trying to stop other countries from giving out information about nutrition, right, to limiting the access to junk food. We're seeing the spread of U.S. corporations all around the world, this formula industry problem. So it's not just a domestic problem. It's something that has repercussions all across the world. So the U.S. policy, as you say, it's federal, it's local, it's also international. Right? So we need to think about how connected all these things so thank you all for coming and thank you.